Okay, so in the last lecture, we we're talking about the std thread class in the standard library. This is the thing that allows us to or provides the functionality of being able to create threads. And what I want to do is just kind of quickly comment on some of the member functions that are provided by this particular class, as well as maybe some member types too. There's a member type called ID, which corresponds to the type that's used to represent the thread ID. Remember again that every joinable thread has a unique ID, and this is the type that's used to represent this ID. Uh, the native handle type we're not going to talk about in the course. This just gives you a hook into kind of the underlying implementation, which is specific to the particular operating system that you're running on, uh, but we're not going to use it, but that's what it's for. Uh, there's some members that are provided, so obviously there's a constructor and destructor, otherwise there's not really much you can do with the class. Uh, we talked about, I think in the last lecture, two kind of variations on the constructor. One is a default constructor. The default constructor will just create a thread that's unjoinable, so it's created in sort of a dormant state. There's no thread of execution associated with it. And then we talked about a constructor where you can provide essentially a, a callable entity, like a functor or, or a function, and provide some optional arguments as well that might be passed into it, and then it will construct the thread based on those, the, the function that you provided for it and the thread will be constructed to run that actual function, execute the code in that function, and we pass whatever arguments you specified. And we talked about the destructor. The important thing to remember about the destructor is it's an error if you try to destroy a thread object that's still joinable. In other words, you haven't actually performed a join operation on it. In terms of the assignment operation, the, the type is only movable, so there, there is no copy assignment operation, it's only move assignment. So operator equals is only for the moving case. Then we have a few more member functions that are listed on this slide. So there's a function called joinable, which is just a predicate. It returns bool to in, a Boolean value to indicate whether the thread is joinable or not. It's true if it's joinable, false otherwise. Uh, member function for getting the ID of a thread, for getting the native handle, which we're definitely not going to use in this course. Uh, I mentioned there's a static member function for this class called hardware concurrency. It just returns the number of concurrent threads that you can, that the hardware can support. It may return zero though. It's allowed to return zero, just indicating this value is not well defined for whatever reason. So we talked about the join and detach operations. So the member function join performs a join operation, which waits for a thread to finish executing and also marks the thread as unjoinable. And then the detach operation is performed by the detach member function and again a detach operation simply uh, dissociates a thread of execution from a thread object and lets it run on independently of the thread object and also marks the thread object as unjoinable and then we also have a swap member function to swap the value of two threads so that's the member functions i wanted to talk about there's not really a lot of functionality that's provided by the thread class in the standard library so let's look at some code examples that actually use threads. Uh, so at the top of the slide, I'll consider the code example. There's actually two different programs here. I'll talk about the one at the top of the slide to begin with. Uh, so what we have here, we have our function called hello, and this is going to be the function that one of the threads is going to be executing in this program. And our main function here, what we're going to do is we're going to create a thread called t, and we're going to pass to the constructor the, the value hello, which is essentially callable entity. In this case, it's a function that can be called something. By callable entity, I just mean something that the function call operator can be applied to. Uh, so in this case, hello is a function. And what this is going to do is it's going to, when this constructor constructs this object, what's going to happen is it's going to, um, at some point later, it's going to cause the execution of a thread to start, which is going to execute the code in this, this function, hello. So it's going to basically print hello world. And then what the main function does after this is it calls join, it performs the join operation on the thread. What this is going to do is it's going to block the thread that's executing main until the function that's executing in the other thread, hello, finishes. In other words, it's going to wait until the, thread is, the other thread is done. And also before the join function returns, it marks the thread unjoinable. At the bottom of the slide, what we have is the code written more succinctly using Lambda expressions. And I want to make some comments about Lambda expressions I mean, if you don't know Lambda expressions, it's not a big deal in the sense that anything you can do with them, you can also do without them. They don't really provide anything other than convenience in the language, but the convenience is a really huge convenience. So I want to comment on them and also so that you can understand a lot of the code examples because I need to try to fit things on slides for code examples, or at least it's highly, highly desirable to do so. 
Uh, without using lambda expressions, code becomes a lot more verbose a lot of the time. So this is one of the reasons why you see lambda expressions occurring very frequently on a lot of these code examples. So for this reason, I want to talk about it so you can understand what's happening in a lot of the code examples that we'll go through subsequently. So with that said, I'm just going to pause here and go off into another section of the lecture slides to just go through some examples involving lambda expressions. So what I have on this slide is an example of the Hello World program, but written in a, in a kind of more strange way that you probably wouldn't be the way you'd be inclined to write Hello World. I'll focus on what's at the bottom of the slide to begin with. So what we've done here is we've defined a class which overloads the function call operator. And what this member function does, it just prints out Hello World. And then what we do in our main function is we create one of these objects, one of these hello objects called lowercase hello. And then what we do is we invoke the function call operator for this object. I mean, this looks like a function call. If you look at line 11 in isolation, and that's the only thing you can look at, you can't distinguish this from a function call. But this is not a function call because hello is not a function. Hello is an object. What's actually happening here is the function call operator is being invoked for hello. And here we're trying to pass no arguments, but this is okay because operator round brackets, the function call operator, it takes no arguments. So things kind of match up and everything works. And what's going to happen is when, when the function call operator is invoked for this hello object, it prints hello world. So this bottom code example is just a very roundabout way of printing hello world. Uh, but we can do this much more succinctly with the code example at the top. I mean, these are essentially more or less functionally equivalent. Uh, but what we're doing here is essentially using something referred to as a lambda expression, which is this thing where you have some square brackets and then some other stuff involving brace brackets and so on. This whole expression here up to, but not including the open parentheses, closing parentheses, semicolon, everything excluding that is what we call a lambda expression. And effectively what a lambda expression is, is just a, sh a short form for creating a functor class. In other words, a class that overloads operator round brackets, the function call operator, creating an object of that type. So like it, it defines the type for you, creates an object of that type, and then you can do whatever you want with that object. So it saves us a lot of uh, typing because all of the effort that we go through to actually define this type here called hello, and then to create one of these objects, hello, we can do it all in one expression. And essentially what the syntax of this expression is doing, the what's in the square brackets here, it's empty. It's what's called a capture list. It allows us to essentially put data members into the class we're creating, but in this, the class that we're trying to create here doesn't have any data members, so we don't need to capture anything, so the square brackets are just empty. Uh, then if there were actually any parameters to the function, the function call operator, this guy here, then we would have in parentheses here the, the list of the arguments for this function, but there are no arguments, uh, so therefore there's no need to put any parentheses in here with the argument list. And then what's followed next in brace brackets is the body of the function for operator round brackets. So like what we're writing here in the brace brackets is, is what's going to go into the class that the compiler generates for us automatically in the body of the function call operator. So the code that we have at the top of the slide is, is sort of functionally equivalent to what's below, except, except the compiler is effectively writing this class for us. Um, one thing that is different though, the class that's generated for us by the compiler here has no name. It's an unnamed class. Um, so this can sometimes cause some complications in the sense that if you want to refer to the name of the type, it has no name. So there's ways that we can get around this, but, but anyway, just as a comment to the side, there is no name associated with this class. Anyway, so this program, when, when we run it effectively, what we're doing here, the first part of this line up to, but not including the parentheses here, this is going to define this, this new uh, functor class, it's going to create an object of this functor class, and then what we want to do is, we, to this object, we want to apply the function call operator. So we add in the function, you know, function call operator here, semicolon. So what this is going to do overall, this whole line, it's going to define this new type, it's unnamed, it's going to create an object of this type, and then we're applying the function call operator to it, which is going to call the operator, which prints hello world. So this is a very roundabout way of printing hello world. But nevertheless, it's a good example, to, a simple example, to illustrate how lambda expressions work. Any questions about this code example? Um, there's just one more that I want to go through, which is this one here. So in this particular case, it's a little bit more complicated example. So first, I'll start with the non-lambda version, which is at the bottom here. So effectively, what I want to do is I want to create a a functor class, which is called linear func, and what it does is it just represents like a linear function, a uh, linear function in, with one independent variable. So I want to be able to evaluate a function which is something like, you know, ax plus b, where I provide x and then it evaluates a times x plus b. 
And the idea here is that when I'm invoking this, uh, this uh, linear function, I only want to provide x. I don't want to provide the a and b. I want the a and b somehow to be captured in the, in the object that I'm dealing with. So this is why there's a data member a and b. So what I'm doing here is I'm defining, first of all, a constructor so that I can create one of these objects and somehow capture the fact that there's this a value and b value that I'm going to need later in my operator round brackets, the function call operator. Um, so these are stored into this, these data members here when I construct the object. And then the main purpose really for this class to exist is for the purpose of this, this function call operator. And what it does, it takes a single parameter x and then it computes the linear function for that value of x. It computes ax plus b essentially. And then what I have down below is some code that actually makes use of this class. So I have a, essentially a factory function, a function that just creates linear, linear func objects called make linear func. And it takes the a and b values that I want to use for this linear function object. And then it simply creates one of these objects and returns it. So not really very particularly exciting. And then we have our main function, which is using all of the code up above. So what we want to do here is we want to evaluate the linear function where the coefficient a is equal to 0.5, the coefficient b is equal to 1, and then we want to evaluate the function at the value 1. So what we're doing here, first of all, is we're creating one of these linear func objects passing a and b. So this function is going to return back to us a linear func object, which is basically being used to construct f. And this object is going to be associated with an a value of 0.5 and a b value of 1.0. And then down below here on this last line, line 17, where we're, it looks like a function call. We have f and then some argument list for what looks like a function call, except f is not actually a function. f is an object. But syntactically, this is a valid thing to do because this function or the type of object that we have here is one that overloads operator round brackets. In other words, it overloads the function call operator and it can be invoked with one float argument. And this is what we're doing here. We're passing a float argument. So this can invoke the operator round brackets. And all this is going to do is going to compute AX plus B and then return it back to us. And then we're simply printing out the result. So this is the, the non-Lambda version of this particular code. Any questions about the non-Lambda version? So with the Lambda expression, what we can do is instead write things in a much more compact manner. And again, the main benefit really of Lambda expressions is they just allow you to decrease the verbosity, verbosity of the code. We can uh, shorten things quite significantly. Um, so what I have here is I'm following a similar pattern. So I have like a factory function that can create these linear function objects. But again, the type is unnamed. When we're using Lambda expressions, the, the so-called type that's generated, it's what's called a closure type. This is just the fancy terminology. Um, the, the, the type is, is something that has no name. So for the return type of this function, when we're returning this thing that we're creating, we can't say a name here because there is no name. So the trick that we use is we use auto, which is basically saying compiler, figure it out. And in this case, the compiler can figure it out because the compiler certainly knows what the type of this Lambda expression is, um, even though it has a, no name, but it, it knows the type. So this is one of the things that you'll notice often when we start using lambdas, sometimes the auto starts creeping up in a lot of places because we don't know the name of the type. Well, it has no name. Therefore, we have to let the compiler you know, use deduction in order to, to as a placeholder for the type name. Mm -hmm. I've used, um, when I've used lambdas in C++, I found that the return type, instead of writing auto, you can write std function. Yeah, we could do that as well, but then like, that has additional overhead because then it's going to basically do some, you know, function probably is going to need to allocate some memory and so on. And, and there's also overhead to actually making the function call through the, the std function object. So um, all other things being equal, probably if you don't need to use std function, it's probably preferable just to directly use the type of whatever the underlying object is. Uh, but you could certainly do that as well. The std function, basically, you can sort of wrap any callable entity in a std function it could be like a, an ordinary function or it could be a, a functor, um, either one of them. And then you can basically use the, the function object to handle both of them. But in this case, we just, we don't really need that because we, well, for what we're doing, it's not really necessary. And probably, it's, again, it's preferred maybe not to use the function unless we really need it because otherwise we're going to probably incur a little bit of overhead, extra overhead. Any other questions so far? So where were we here? So um, if we look at what's happening inside the body of this function, what we're doing is we're, we're using a lambda expression to actually create this, this uh, functor class. So in this particular case, we actually have a something in the capture list. So the capture list is the thing in the square bracket. So effectively what we're doing is we're saying in the scope that we're currently in, there should be something called A and something called B. Grab these things by copying them and put them into data members into this class that's being created. Uh, so effectively, the value of a and b, which are, are, are these local variables here, they're going to be 
captured by copying them and they'll effectively get put into data members in this class that's being created. Um, then the next thing in the syntax that we have here in parentheses is the argument list for operator round brackets. So this means that the operator round brackets for the class that's being created by the compiler, it takes a single float parameter and the return value we're not specifying explicitly, but what will happen is the compiler will look at the return type and deduce what the return type is based on the expression that we have here. So A, X, and B are all floats. So if you take and multiply some floats and add some floats, you get a float. So the type that's going to be deduced for the return type is float. There is a, weak, a way to explicitly specify the return type, but typically for something like this, just a, like a one-liner in terms of the body of the code, probably we just let the, the compiler deduce the type. Anyway, so the return type would be deduced to be float which is what we want in this case. And then we're going to, this is going to create one of those objects. And then what we're doing is we're returning it. And again, we're using auto here because the, the type that's being generated is unnamed. So we can't refer to it by name. We just use auto and let the compiler deduce the type. Mm -hmm. If we want to have a function that takes in a lambda parameter, a lambda function, can we use auto in the parameter list of that function? Well, if it was a template, like you could, you could certainly do this. You would make the code a template function, for example, and then you can take it as a template parameter. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Anyway, so this inter or actually, I guess I should probably look at the main function as well. So if you look at the main function, the code's actually using the that above factory function. It looks very similar to what we had in the the code down below. Actually, it may even be almost identical, except for the fact we have this auto here. So again, we're trying to compute the, the linear function where the constant a is 0.5 and the constant b is 1. So we call this factory function to create one of these linear function objects passing in a and b. And then what's returned back in this case, it's different from the bottom example in the sense the return type is different. This is going to return some kind of uh, closure type, um, some unnamed type. And then we're using auto here because the type is unnamed. And then this is f is going to be constructed um, based on the return value. And then down below, we're just printing out the value that's returned by f when we pass a value of 1 in as an argument. And again, this may look kind of like a function call, but it's not because f is not a function, f is an object. So what's actually happening here is the function call operator is being invoked for this class. Um, but we don't explicitly write the function call, like we don't explicitly write the code. The compiler is generating the code for this class. Anyway, so this sort of thing is very, very useful, this, the lambda expressions, because they can greatly reduce the amount of typing you need to do, especially if you have a lot of kind of use once functor classes. You want use it once, throw it away. It's, it's really a lot of extra boilerplate to write all this stuff for something. You're just going to use it once and then throw it away. So lambda expressions are extremely helpful, especially for kind of you use it once and get rid of it. Um, then, then you can save a lot of repetition of having to write all the boilerplate for the function call operator, possibly a constructor to capture some some uh, data members and so on. Any question? Um, in the, like the, the constructor of the square brackets, do you have to, do those variables have to be um, constructed before the, uh, the lambda function is constructed? I'm not sure. You're for referring to like this part of the, the lambda expression, the capture list? So, so these variables have to exist in the scope that you're in. Like they, they have to be there. So in this, this is the case here because A and B are local variables here. If, if these weren't called A and B and like there's no A and B that exist in the scope that you're in and you say A, B, this is a compiler because it has to be something that it can actually capture that must exist already. Okay, so, so the idea of putting that within another function is not just to like put a name to it, but to also give it like a hidden scope to initialize new variables when you make a call. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Like, like if putting the lambda function within make linear func and within the make linear func scope, it creates float A and float B. So the idea of that is to like create a new scope to like actually create as if the struct had two variables inside of it. Well, it, well, it's not necessary that if the issue is like this lambda expression didn't need to go inside some kind of factory function. Like we could have just taken this lambda and created it like in our main function and then used it. The only reason for doing it this way was just, or, or sorry, used it in the main function down below here. Um, the only reason for putting it in a function like this is just maybe following some kind of more modular practice. Like we have a function which its clear purpose is to create one of these things and return it. And then we have some code that's using it. And, but we could certainly take this expression here and kind of bring it, bring it, or sorry, bring it down into the main here. Like just use a lambda expression directly down here. Like for example, we could say auto f and then initialize this f to be this the result of evaluating this lambda expression. 
And in this case, if we did this, then the A and B that would be captured would be this A and this B because they would be the ones that are in that scope. So again, it's, it's really just to make the, the example a little bit more modular that there's kind of a factory function for generating the, the objects, but we don't really need to do this. Does that answer your question? I'm not, I'm not sure if I was answering what you're asking. It seemed like that might have been what you're asking. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Um, I guess it's not as important in terms of a lot of the functions, but just what you're saying with the whole factory function. Mm -hmm. like, is this actually a really like a, a common practice to, to have these factory functions? Because yeah, it is. It is actually quite a common practice to to have functions that sort of their sole purpose is to create objects of a particular type. It's not like you always use them, but but it's not an uncommon thing to see. There are a lot of a lot of libraries and things that have this sort of uh, functionality that's provided. I mean, one benefit, I guess, that you could have with factory functions is like all places where objects of that type are being created are isolated in one place. So for example, if you wanted to maybe add some debugging code to, to maybe print something out every time one of these objects is created, you put it in one place. And then it covers every place that you could possibly create one of these objects. Whereas if you create them when you need them all scattered around the code, then if you wanted to, for example, add some extra debugging or something, extra logging messages saying these objects have been created, you'd have to add it in every single place in the code where the object's been created. So, I mean, that's just maybe one example. It's not necessarily the main reason that you'd want to do this, but it gives like an example of why you might want to. Um, but it is a very common sort of practice to have to this, to these so-called factory functions. Um, any other questions? Okay, so with that said, I guess finally I can go back and look at the bottom part of the bottom code example for this thread related example. So the whole other discussion was just kind of a tangential side discussion so that we can actually understand what this code here is doing. So this code here is basically just another fancy way of writing a hello world program. But in this case, we're using uh, Lambda expressions. So what we're doing here is we're creating a thread called T and for the callable entity that we're passing as an argument, what we're doing is we're creating a, a functor uh, like a, a functor, and there's a function object, um, because when a, la L, a, when a lambda expression is evaluated, what it gives you is an object. It basically defines a type, creates an object of that type, and gives you that object. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're basically creating an object um, who's defined in such a way that it overloads operator round brackets so that when you invoke it, it takes no parameters when you invoke it, and what it's gonna do is print out hello world. And this is what we're passing to this thread constructor. So what it's going to do, it's going to spin off a new thread. What the thread's going to do is execute the operator round brackets for this, this functor class. And what that operator round brackets is going to do is it's just going to print hello world. And then the main function, what it's doing is after, after we return from the constructor, it's going to wait until the thread is done executing. So we do a join operation on the thread, and that's going to basically block the thread that's executing main until this thread completes. And then it's going to join with it, and the thread will be marked unjoinable at that point. Any questions? Oh, on this side, what we have is just, I want to illustrate how arguments are passed to the thread function. Like when you, when you spin off a new thread, um, you have to provide it with some code to run. And how do the arguments get passed to that code? It essentially always passed by value. There's no way to not pass things by value. So either it's gonna get copied or moved depending on sort of the rules about how you copy versus how, you, you know, when you copy versus when you move. So what I have here is uh, some function called do work. And what I want to do is I want to spin off threads that are going to execute this function. And all it's doing is it's just looping over the elements of some vector and printing out the elements. So in the, the main function that's, that's uh, using the code up above, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a thread called T1. And I'm going to say for the, the code that I want to execute, I'm going to execute the code associated with the function do work. And I want the I need to provide an argument to this function when I call it, essentially a vector. So I'm gonna pass it this vector V as an argument. And what's gonna happen in this case is, and this is important to understand, is that because you're always passing by value, it's irrelevant that I'm, I'm this function here is using pass by reference. What happens is that the constructor that's constructing the thread will take the thing, that, that the, the V here, it will make a copy of it, and then that copy is what gets passed by reference to this function. So you cannot avoid the fact that there's a copy, at least without doing something special. You're the copy or move. Like it always passes by value. Um, if we want to move instead of copy, so this would be kind of inefficient. We probably don't want to copy necessarily. Maybe it'd be better to move. Uh, instead, what we can do is we can throw in a std move here on the V. So instead of writing just V, we can say std move V. And then we know by rules we talked about earlier in the course, this is going to cause a move to happen. 
Um, so effectively what happens in this case is it's going to take the value of V, propagate it to another variable by moving. And then that variable is what's going to get passed by reference into this function here. So in either case, we're not, the overall effect in total is not passing by reference. We're basically passing by reference something that was already either copied or moved to, to generate. Um, and in both cases, we also have to join with the thread after it's done. So here we do a join with the thread T1. Here we do a join with the thread T2. But that's not really the main point of this example. Um, any questions? So what happens if we do want to have sort of reference semantics? So we want things to sort of behave as if we were passing by reference, because sometimes you might want to do this. Um, what we can do instead is we can use, there's a type in the standard library called reference underscore wrapper. And what this function std ref does is it returns one of these reference wrapper, wrapper types. And what the reference wrapper type is, is essentially a wrapper that you can wrap, like basically wrap any type in. And what it does is it gives it reference semantics so that when you actually copy these objects around, what it does is it actually copies a pointer to it. So it basically beha behaves as if you're handing around a reference for it. So if this doesn't actually avoid the copy, what's gonna happen is the type that you're passing here will be a reference wrapper type in the standard library. But when you copy a reference wrapper, it doesn't copy the underlying object it refers to. It just copies a pointer to it or a reference to it. Uh, so this basically avoids the, um, the uh, copying operation or the copying of your vector type. I mean, there's still going to be a copy of this reference wrapper type. But the overall effect of what you're concerned with is probably whether or not this vector thing is being passed in by reference. And the overall effect that you end up with is it's as if it was passed by reference. Anyway, because sometimes you may want to pass things by reference. Any questions? So for the copy example, like uh, when, when we're going to do something to modify the vector, so the original one will still keep the same. But we don't know uh, changing the original vector. Okay, well, I guess the way that the code is written, we wouldn't actually be able to modify it because it's a reference to const. But if we took this const out so that actually it could mutate the value of, of the vector inside this function, then um, if you took out the const here, then obviously this function could change what change the value of v. But if it did change it, the thing it's changing is actually a copy of the original thing. So if it were to change v, like for example, if this const was taken away and then we replaced the code here by something that actually changed v, um, if we did things in this way, like just this this case here, which I didn't talk about because this is just kind of overlapping with the previous slide. If we're doing doing something like this, this is going to copy v. And then the copy gets passed by reference. So we're, we're changing, when we're changing inside this function here, V, we're changing a copy of the original thing. So the original thing doesn't change. Uh, if on the other hand, we use this kind of a construct here, then what effectively we're doing is we're, we're, we are actually effect, in effect passing a reference to V. So if we did this and then this function actually did change V, it would, we'd actually see the change here. So, I mean, which of these kind of constructs you use, something like this line here or this line here, which you would use would depend on what you want the overall effect to be. Do you really want that thread to be able to change the variable that, that you're looking at in main? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, but if you do pass by reference, then obviously you have the possibility that the thread that's executing main could change the value or access V. This function could access V. Now you have the possibility of a data race because they could both be accessing the same data at the same time with one of them writing. Mm -hmm. So before, uh, in this case, we're passing it by reference. The actual value still lives in like the original threads uh, address space, right? So that well, all these threads are running in the mm -hmm. same address right, space. Right. But but one of the differences, like each thread will have its own stack. Right. So this is probably the reason why you can't really avoid the copy because when this function gets called, the variables for this function are on its stack. But when you're passing arguments to the function here, the arguments are on the stack of main. They're like on different stacks. So you somehow have to get the thing from one stack onto the other. And this is kind of what forces, at least this is my understanding of the underlying implementation. This is kind of what makes it necessary to have something like a copy or move because you, you have to get the stuff from one stack, like the stack of main onto the stack of the other thread. Because each thread is going to have its own stack because they run independently of one another and they have their own local variables. So they would have to have their own stacks. So does this uh, reduce like the efficiency of the cache of the other thread because it has to constantly go to like the other like address space to, to check this value? You well, they're they're all in the same address space, but it could it could affect the like it could have effects on the cache because now you have two threads running, so they're going to effectively be probably using different parts of memory potentially, and then they can sort of compete for slots in the cache. So it can affect caching, but 
but not in the sense that they're, they are running in the same address space. This is one of the big advantages of having an application with like a pro single process with multiple threads versus having a whole bunch of processes with a single thread is that if you run all the threads in the same, as the same process, they all run in the same address space. So it's very easy to share data between them because if you want to access something, you just read the value. It's in your address space. If they're running in separate processes though, then they have different address spaces and one process can't peer into the address space of the other. Then you have to use other communication mechanisms to get data from one, one, one thread in one process to another thread in a different process. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, or at least it's good enough. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, so let's move along then. Uh, so we can move threads, but we can't copy them. So what this slide is illustrating is just some examples of moving threads around in various different ways. So I have a kind of a, another sort of factory kind of function. It makes a thread, specifically a thread, which is going to print out hello world, and it returns this thread object. Um, returns the, well, basically it creates, it creates a thread that's going to print hello world. And this is by the fact that we've created, it's gonna start running at some later point and we're returning this thread object that was created. Uh, then we have a very much simpler function called identity. It just takes a thread in and it just returns the thread that was passed in. So it basically is an identity kind of operation, just returns back whatever was passed to it. And then we have some code that's using the code from above in, inside main here. So we create a thread uh, called T1 uh, by constructing it from the return value from make make thread, and I think this case maybe not that interesting. I think this might this is probably going to be copy elision. I think so. Um, this is maybe not so interesting from the point of view of what we're talking about here. Uh, thread T two when we create this thread though, we're creating it by the, the uh, from th thread T one. If we if we didn't put the std move in here, this would generate a compiler because the threads are not copyable; they're only movable. So if we left left out the std move this would be invoking copy construction, the copy construct T2 from T, T1, but this is not allowed because uh, threads are not copyable, uh, but we can move them. So if we do something like this, what will happen is we'll propagate the value of this thread into thread T2, and what thread T1 will be left with is sort of a dormant thread, like it's not associated with any thread of execution, it's just kind of dead. And then of course we can kind of play ping pong here, then what we're doing is we're taking the thread T2 and then moving it back into T1, but here we're using move assignment to do this. Um, we can also do things like we could, for example, call this identity function by passing in the thread T1 with a move. So if we say move here, it's going to propagate the value into this function by moving, so we're okay, because we're not trying to copy, which the thread class doesn't permit. Um, when we return T here, this is going to return by moving. Um, so um, again, we don't run into any problems with respect to trying to copy a type that's, that's uncopyable. So what happens is effectively that there's gonna be a temporary object associated with the right-hand side of this assignment, which holds the value that's returned from the function. And that value is basically moved into, and then we're gonna take that value, we're going to move, move, assignment to T, move assign it to T1. So we're doing basically a bunch of moves here. And then at the end, we join with the thread three T1, because again, you don't want the thread to be destroyed if it's not been joined with. Any questions? So again, this is just trying to illustrate like how we can move threads around in various ways, but we can't copy them though. Uh, once we start writing uh, code that has multiple threads, then things can get really quite uh, horrible in terms of uh, lifetime bugs. Like uh, one of the common bugs in code in general is that you can have bugs with respect to the lifetime of variables where you try to access the, the value of the variable after it's reached the end of its lifetime and been destroyed. Um, even in single threaded programs, this is a difficult problem sometimes. Like in other words, it's very common to see bugs in terms of, of lifetimes being abused for variables, but things get even worse when you start to have multi-threaded code because you, you have to not just ask the question, like, is it safe to destroy this thing? Because I, the thread that's running right now, I'm not going to use this, like this thread's not going to use this. But you also have to ask the question, is any other thread going to use this stuff if, before I destroy it? And it becomes a little bit more tricky perhaps because now you have to be sure that no other thread in the system is going to access this, this particular variable before you get rid of it and destroy it. Otherwise you have a problem. And this code example just illustrates one way in which things can kind of go wrong. So, uh, what we have here, we have a main function which starts out by calling this function start thread. So what start thread does is it uh, creates a vector of ints with a fairly large number of uh, elements in the array, initializing them all to one. Then it fires up a thread which is going to execute the code up above in this function thread func. And what this function is going to do is it's going to iterate all over all the elements in the vector from the beginning of the vector to the end and add them up. And then it's going to print out the value that it, it accumulated by adding them all up. 
Um, but the, the problem here is that if we continue along in this code here for a start thread, what's going to happen is it calls detach. And what detach does it is allows the, the thread of execution to start running on independently of the thread object. So we can destroy the thread object. It's fine. That thread is off on its own. It's going to run independently. And the problem is now, since we've detached the thread and we're returning from this function, the instant that we return from this function, V, which is a local variable of this function, will get destroyed. And the problem here is we're destroying V, but we're not the only thread that's using V. This thread over here is still probably running along because this is a fairly large array that we passed into it. There's like something like a million elements or a fairly large number of elements that's passed in here. So this thing's probably still accumulating, accessing these elements. And then when we return from this function, we destroy that, array, that array that, that's being summed, summed up by the other thread. So this is just an example to illustrate how things can go wrong in terms of you know, lifetimes of objects and so on. We have to be even more careful when we have multiple threads to make sure that before we destroy something that not only is the thread that's destroying it not using that thing anymore, but none of the other threads that are running in the system might be using this thing as well. And probably if we run this code, probably what's going to happen is the, the well, probably the code will crash or do something pretty nasty. It's not going to work properly. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, if you were to not pass a pointer, but just a copy of the object, like just V is the argument on line 15. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so instead of passing a pointer, we actually like copy the object, pass it by copying. Okay. Then, then, would then we'd be OK. okay. I mean, it'd be much less efficient, I guess, would be the downside, because then we're going to have to incur the cost of copying this large array. But if we did that, then we would be safe, because then the thing that this would be operating on would be a copy. And then if we destroy the, the original thing, that's OK, because it's not using it. Yeah. Any other questions? So as you can see, we're going to cover this in the course in a little bit less detail than what's on the slide. So I just skipped over a few slides. Um, I want to make a few comments with respect to std thread, the std thread class, with respect to exception safety in particular. Uh, this is one of the pet peeves of mine, which is that when you're teaching concurrency, of course, you want to just use std thread at the beginning in the code examples. But when you do this, like none of your code is going to be exception safe because um, it's, it's an error to hit the destructor of a thread when that thread is still joinable. So if you imagine that you have some code that's you know, creating threads and then uh, at some point an exception gets thrown, then you start doing stack unwinding. There's a good chance, assuming that you, for example, didn't catch the exception at some place, there's a good chance that you're gonna need to destroy a thread. But then that thread, if it's, not jo if it's, um, if it's still joinable, in other words, it still has an associated uh, thread of execution running, um, then what you're going to have happen is an exception gets thrown while you're handling the stack unwinding process, which is going to terminate your program. Um, so in other words, the issue here is that uh, if you're using threads, you probably would never want to use just this thread class by itself. You'd probably want to use it in conjunction with some RAI class, like what we've talked about earlier in the course, where basically you have some class that does cleanup. And the cleanup that you'd want to do here is you'd want to make sure that the thread is joined with before it gets destroyed. Um, so unfortunately, in the standard library currently, there is no type that's provided by the standard library that allows you to do this. I believe in C++20, they're adding something that will fix this problem finally. Um, but anyway, for the time being, we just have lots of examples, code examples that are kind of wrong in the sense that they're not really exception safe. Uh, we can fix this, this particular problem, by just creating a wrapper. This is kind of a hack, maybe the simplest way to fix this. We can take the thread class, we can inherit from it, and really all we want to do is you just want to change the destructor. So the destructor does something like this. It says, if the thread is joinable, we join. And then this way, if, if for some reason, you know, for example, an exception gets thrown, and then the destructor gets invoked for our thread, what's going to happen here is we'll check to see if it's joinable. If it is, we'll join. And then this way, we avoid the problem that we would try to destroy a thread object before we've joined with it. Um, um, this particular example, code example here would is assuming that we're not doing like further inheritance from, from this type scoped thread. Um, but for example, we could do something like what's shown at the bottom of the slide here where we're trying to fire up a whole bunch of threads. I guess it's 16 threads. So we create a vector of these scoped thread threads, these ones up above here, ones that kind of clean up after themselves. They join if, if they need to join in the destructor. And then what we're going to do, we're, this is an example of using in place back. In place back is is different from pushback. If we use in placeback, what this does, it actually constructs an object in the container. Um, this is very useful. If you have an object that doesn't already exist outside the container and you just want to put it in the container, then never call pushback. Instead, use in placeback. And in placeback takes as parameters the 
the parameters for the constructor for the object you want to construct. So what this will do here by using in placeback, and in this case we have to use in placeback because the thing that we're actually creating is a thread object. We have a vector of thread objects. We can't move or we can't copy thread objects. So what we need to do here is use in placeback to actually create the thread object in this container, and this avoids the problem that we need to to uh, copy it at a later point to propagate it into the container. And we're doing this like uh, 16, looping over this uh, 16 times. So we're going to create 16 threads. And at the end here, notice the code becomes a lot cleaner. Like we don't have to worry about destroy, like uh, joining with the threads at the bottom here, because what will happen is because we're using the scope thread type, whenever the scope thread reaches the end of its lifetime, it checks if it's joinable. If it is, it joins. Um, otherwise, it just destroys itself as normally. But this way, we avoid the, the headaches of having to make sure that we always remember to join with the thread. And more importantly, if exceptions get thrown, well, in this code, code I guess no exceptions are going to be thrown. But if exceptions were to be thrown, still the code would behave in a reasonable manner. It would catch the exception. Um, or sorry, when it hits the destructor, it would check if the thread is joinable. And if it is, it would join. Otherwise, we just uh, return normally from the destructor. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, this is just a quick inheritance question. When the scope thread destructor goes, will it call the destructor for the std thread after? Um, like, one, like if you define the destructor for the scope thread, does it also invoke the destructor for the std thread in case it doesn't? Yes, it's, it's gonna it's gonna invoke the destructor for the the base class object. Okay. Um, the, the, basically, what happens in a destructor, like the, in terms of the order that things happen in, you're going to destroy first of all the the, like the scope thread object is going to do its stuff. Like you execute the body of the destructor first, and then what happens is you're going to then destroy the base class, any base class objects. In this case, there's one. But the thing that that saves us here is that before the destructor for the base class object gets invoked, which is sort of the thing we care about, when that gets hit, that thread better be joined with already. But we've joined with it already here. So this is a basic idea. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. What is about the main, main process? Normal process does it next before sleep. So when the uh, when we do the work, we run the work thread. We like keep running after even after the the main thread is quick. Um. Well, the well, this is another reason why you'd want to join too. Join with the thread because like the so the main thread is not going to exit until all of these other threads are done. But the thing that guarantees this is that um, this destructor, like the threads that we're creating are all embedded into these scope thread objects. So when these scope thread objects get destroyed, every one of them is going to do a join operation. And part of what a join operation does is it waits until that thread that you're joining with finishes, whatever it was doing. So what happens here is in this loop here, we're going to fire up like 16 threads. And then these threads are all going to sleep. So it's probably safe to assume that if nothing else special happened, but something special does happen, if nothing else happened, main would finish and before the threads finished what they were doing. But this won't happen because there's also something else going on here. Because when we reach the end of this loop, just before we hit the closing brace bracket here, there's nothing really stopping us from doing more stuff. But once we hit the closing brace bracket, what happens is now we have 16 scope threads, all of which have to be destroyed. And what happens is we're going to start destroying them. And what's going to happen is if these threads are still running, which is probably pretty likely because they're sleeping for one second. So probably they're, it's going to be maybe like 999 milliseconds more or something before we can actually terminate the program. What's going to happen is when we try to join with the, maybe the very first thread here, like when the destructor gets called, it's going to say, is it joinable? Yes, it's joinable because it's still running. So it's, this is going to block us. And we're going to go to sleep waiting until that thread finishes. And then when it finishes, the thread gets marked unjoinable, and we wake up and return from the join. And depending on the particular timing, it might be the case that we wait for the very first one, and then by the time we wake up, all the other threads are done. And then when we say joining for the remaining 15 destructor calls, maybe immediately it says it's, it's done, it's done, it's done, and we don't block. Uh, but at least um, the fact that we're joining with the, the thread in the destructor here, this guarantees that we can't have the possibility that main actually exits while these threads are still not finished executing. But if we didn't do the join effectively, what we would do, be doing is trying to do this. We'd be trying to exit the main thread before the other threads are finished, which is just going to violently terminate everything. Because once main's done, your program, your process is toast. Uh, so we wouldn't want that happening. Uh, so, so, so if, if, if we don't use the scope thread and we replace the embrace break, embrace back with the join, the, the, main, the main process can still wait. If, if we replace this scope thread with a thread, what would happen is as soon as we hit line 10, 
we're going to get an uncaught exception error saying, because what's going to happen then is we're going to try to destroy the very first thread in this array. Because it's probably very likely that because we're sleeping for one second that the amount of time it takes to get from the end of this loop to the end of this brace bracket is probably on the order of nanoseconds or something like that. Uh, so it's a good bet that all of these threads are still running. So what's going to happen is when we try to destroy the very first one, we're, if we're, you're saying that it's not a scope thread, we're using a thread, but what will happen is we'll call the destructor for the thread. The thread is still running, so it's joinable. And then the, lang the library is required to throw an exception saying, you can't have a thread that I, to, that's to be destroyed if it's still running effectively. In other words, it's going to prevent you from the stupidity of you trying to terminate this program, violently killing a number of threads that are still running. Instead, what it's going to do is a flag it as an error, essentially, and, and throw an exception. I mean, it's still going to have the end effect of killing your program because we're not catching the exception. But this is one of the reasons why it's kind of deemed to be a programming error to be destroying a thread before you've joined with it. Because this could allow kind of ridiculous things to happen where the thread's still running. It's not done when it's doing it. You're trying to terminate the program now because it means exiting. Um, so they're trying to prevent you from doing things like this. Any other questions? We're running quite a bit over time here, so I better stop.